This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, and you're joining us on Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. As we all know, likeable science is just what its name suggests. It's how science is likable, how science is fun, how science is interesting. Science is not something that occurs off in distant ivory towers done by arcane, strange people with bubbling chemicals. It's all around us, it impacts our lives every day, and it should be embraced. And with me today in Think Tech Studios is Danny Ruthenberg Marshall. Welcome, Danny. Thanks for having me. And Danny is a videographer, also a human ecologist by education, I guess. And I thought we'd explore some of the issues around how to share aspects of science, particularly nature, with people, why this is important, uh, what it may do, what happens if we don't do it. Uh, Danny's just back from a, a, a long journey through uh, the Yukon River, right, from source to mouth. Very long, yeah, yes. Uh, 60 days or something on the river. Yeah, about two months, yeah. 1,800 miles. Oof. It was uh, a long journey, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. but uh, must have been amazing uh, to, to do. And you essentially documented this mm -hmm. all the way down the, the river, the skies, the mountains, the people that you were with, the wildlife you ran into. Yeah. Yeah, uh, excellent, excellent. Um, before we get into that, you, you've done some other video before this. You had, uh, I've seen one, one or two of your pieces, mm -hmm. uh, some shorter pieces mostly. Um, anything you want to tell the, our audience about, about those before we... Uh, well, there's not really much to it. This is something I've been doing now for six years since I graduated college. Uh, I studied human ecological film in school and really dove into it with a passion once I graduated. Uh, mostly I work with environmental nonprofits and other uh, organizations that deal with nature to really tell the stories that they want told, to educate the general public about them. Uh, and so I've been doing that for a while, and there have been lots of great clients. I've worked with the Student Conservation Association, the Sierra Club, 350.org, a bunch of great organizations there, but I haven't done a full-length, feature-length documentary until this endeavor. Cool. And I think we've got a, uh, a, a video clip that you just sort of put together from some little snippets from this. It's, it's, it's not a full-length documentary, yeah, don't worry. Not worry. at all. <laughs> uh, it's about two, well, th getting on maybe three minutes, I guess, which we can show at any point here. The Yukon River, 1,800 miles across two countries and in some of the most remote regions left on planet Earth. That's what we set out to paddle, and paddle it we did. The land we passed through varied wildly, from spectacular mountain ranges towering over the landscape to endless flats stretching into the distance. The weather was constantly changing. At times, it was beastly hot, even in the Arctic, with the sun burning our faces and forcing us into the river. Other times, we'd have on everything we own and still be shivering to the bone. Storms wreaked havoc on our schedule and filled our boats with water. So we pulled over for a major storm, got the tarp up and everything. And right as we were getting ready to start leaving again, decided to start raining. But there's not too much wind and uh, not too much thunder and lightning, so we're just gonna keep plowing through it, bit by bit. We cross paths with wildlife all along our journey. Fish play an integral role in the ecosystem and we both observed and ate them. To protect our smell bowls from bears, we had an electric fence with us. So the only things we successfully shocked were ourselves. At the sea, we even found a dead beluga whale. Is that a dead animal? Yeah. We are at the Bering Sea, and we found a beached whale, a literal beached whale. Are those barnacles? It is day 57, and we have made it to the Bering Sea. You can see behind me. Uh, finally, the ocean. After all this time, we just spent three, four, five hours sitting on this uh, coast, hanging out, enjoying the experience, and waiting for the tides to slowly, slowly reverse. Uh, we think it's pretty much at its lowest tide, and we'll start being able to ride that high tide coming back in to the island we left our camp at. You can tell I'm a little out of breath because uh, I'm out of shape and we just hauled our boat from where it got beached three or four hours ago as the tide was higher up, pulling it all the way out to now. 
but it's it's different being here. I'm so excited to be done, so excited now that we're paddling the reverse direction. I think I'll be even more excited when we're done paddling entirely, but uh, it's been, been a good ride. Wow, all right, that was amazing. That was a, a nice summary of what, what went on, some of the scenery yeah. you saw. As you were saying while we were actually watching it, you, there was more mountains and that really showed in the, in the journey, but. Uh, yeah, early, yeah, earlier on yeah, yeah. when we were in the Canadian part, yeah. uh, we were deep in those mountain valleys. Excellent. So, I mean, in part, you were trying to capture in this, uh, the, the scenery, of course, the, the wild, the river, but it was also somewhat about the people, right? And you, I, had, you had a crew of nine. Right. Nine people, yeah. and I would say it was almost entirely about the people in the natural environment. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not making a nature documentary here. I'm not telling the story of the river. I'm telling that story of how we as this group of human beings are interacting with our natural world and growing and learning because of it, because of the experiences that we have on a daily basis out there and being in a situation that's so wild. Uh -huh. You know, this region of the world, the Yukon Territory in Alaska, is 40 times less populated or something along those lines than Siberia. Uh -huh. It is incredibly remote. Uh, we would find mostly just villages with a few hundred people, a couple larger ones to about a thousand. But for the most part, we were just in wilderness day after day. Uh -huh. uh, and so it was the story, how do these people grow? How do these people experience uh, this natural world and learn from it? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's, that's uh, putting people in the natural world, particularly under sort of stressful situations, it, it's a very uh, thought-provoking thing. Um, they can uh, react well, they can react badly, mm -hmm. right? I don't know if, you, if you've ever read the, the um, story, uh, what, what's it called now, I've lost it, but of Ernest Shackleton's expedition to Antarctica. I know of it, but I haven't read uh, the story. Yeah, um, oh, what is the name of it? It'll come to me later. One wonderful book about that, about how all mm -hmm. his ship is crushed. He gets his whole crew, treks 800 miles across the Antarctic ice, yeah. the hundreds of miles across open ocean in small boats. Yeah. And, uh, to, to be clear, that expedition was orders of magnitude <laughs> larger and more difficult than what yeah, we just yeah. did. Endur Ours was fun. <laughs> Endurance is the name of the yes. book, yes. All right, it, it, it's actually a great, a great book to read. If you're ever feeling bad, you're feeling mm -hmm. life is being really tough, you know, mean to you, and you're, you're having to put up with a lot and suffer, you read that and you think, no. Like, my, my worries are very trivial. You know? yeah. uh, because of, anyhow, um, so, so talk about this. Tell me a little bit about how this thing came about. I mean, this was obviously a huge logistical undertaking. How did you get involved in it, and, and how much time did that take? And yeah. Uh, well, I have a friend, uh, and he does all sorts of these expeditions. Uh, and we actually met, I was attempting to through hike the Appalachian Trail in 2010. He successfully did it, but we met along the trail. Uh, and he was part of my student thesis uh, documentary that I produced about that expedition. And I hadn't seen him since then. But we stayed in touch loosely every couple of years, checking in, how are you, how you doing? And he called me up uh, about two years ago, two and a half years ago now, said, Danny, how you doing? Uh, Great, Anthony, how are you? And he said, I've got, I've got an idea. <laughs> Want to paddle the entire Yukon <laughs> River with me? Sure. <laughs> and so for two years then, uh, we planned, mostly he planned, I was along for the ride and to make the documentary. You know, that was the very initial contact was we want a documentary made about this experience, made about the journey. And so then he did the logistics, I planned for the documentary. And over time, he connected one way or another with all these other individuals, sometimes very loosely through friends of a friend. And Everyone was interested, we all came together, we contributed the funds that we needed, he did the logistics and we showed up and paddled the entire river. And it wasn't like these were, you were all expert canoers or experienced outdoors no. persons? Most of us had some level of uh, experience in the wilderness. Okay. Uh, I'd say of the nine of us, probably seven had good wilderness experience. Okay. And Anthony had good canoeing experience. Okay. He'd done the entire Mississippi River and the entire Missouri River. So he already had 5,000 miles okay. of river okay. under his belt. Uh, but for the rest of us, you know, I had a 40 mile trip I did last summer because I thought <laughs> I should be in a canoe before <laughs> I go out here. I should have some experience with that. And some people had 
never been in a canoe until we got to the beginning of the Yukon River and said, here's a paddle, jump in the canoe. <laughs> Which end do I hold? <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, but everyone, we took it very slowly in the beginning, and everyone had time to learn and get accustomed to the boats, figure out how to do the different strokes, how to steer, what the difference between the bow and the stern was. And by the time we got 100 miles down the river, we were all doing very solidly. Oh, good, good. And so you've been looking at this issue of how people interact act and interact when, when out mm -hmm. in nature. What, what do you think sort of is the value of this, the impact? What, what, are, you, what are you trying to do with, with video, vi videoing in this? Ideally, through most of my videos that are along these lines, you know, if I do one for a client, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. But the videos that are just about an experience in nature, I want folks to watch it and be inspired to have their own wilderness experience. Not necessarily two months on the Yukon, <laughs> but even going for a hike in the local park, even going out and checking out your local national park or the nearby mountain range that's there, or throwing pebbles into a creek. Mm -hmm. Anything that's going to get you outside, mm -hmm. away from the screens, away from the computers and smartphones and everything, and have that experience with nature is going to provide some value to you emotionally and mentally uh, and give you a better understanding of what it is that we are steadily losing through the massively growing population and environmental degradation. Yeah, and, and there's actually now some studies going on because more and more of the world's population lives their lives in urban centers and mm. increasing large urban centers and spends less and less time out in any sort of what you might think of as authentic nature, um, whatever that may mean. Uh, but and people are speculating, and scholars are studying this, is what are we losing here? If, if people don't go out and spend time in the wild, will they appreciate the wild? Will they fight to save the wild? Will they contribute to save the wild? Will they ask their elected representatives to vote to save the wild? Or will they let the pool get paved over, basically? Yeah, so this is, you're trying to you figure seeing a video is probably better than not seeing the video, right? Uh, yeah, and, and you, you know, you know even if all that work only inspires one person to get out for one more moment, that's still something that's worthwhile. Ideally, it inspires a lot more people to get out and truly learn and experience. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely something that I, I, want, I want to understand better in my own life. Mm -hmm. I still feel like, even after this experience and so many others, that I'm a novice when it comes to understanding the natural world, mm -hmm. the environment all around us. And if I can do this and still feel like a novice, I know that the people who are glued to their screens <laughs> definitely don't have that understanding yeah. of the natural world. Yeah, yeah. Hey, we're going to come back and explore this further and more in depth, but right now we're going to have to take a short break. Uh, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Daniel Ruthenberg Marshall is in the studio with me today. We're talking about his journey down the Yukon and about human ecology, nature, and videography all, all rolled into one. We'll be back in another minute. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. And you're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. You're on Think Tech Hawaii. With me today is Danny Ruthenberg Marshall. Danny is just back from an uh, eight-week trip from source to mouth on the Yukon, paddling yeah. down it, video video videoing it. Uh, I, would say, I was going to say every step of the way, every stroke of the way, I yeah. guess it would be more appropriate. Um, and we saw earlier a, a wonderful uh, video of uh, a little sort of overview of, of the whole thing, a nice snippet you put together. 
And we were talking about the, the, the value of being in nature and what this means to people. So uh, tell me what it is, I mean, what did you learn from this experience? What did I learn from this experience? Yeah. Uh, I learned that I should get into better shape before I try and <laughs> paddle 2,000 or almost 2,000 miles. Uh, I had some shoulder injuries that I dealt with and a couple of back injuries, just overuse. Uh, so definitely learned that in terms of my own personal life. I, I also learned that the things that we think of as true wilderness are even less wilderness than I expected. Uh, I was thinking I would go out onto the Yukon River and I would go days on end without seeing people. You know, you're, you're in this incredibly remote place. Um, but the river, in essence, has become a very lightly trafficked highway uh, for all the commerce between these towns and people traveling back and forth because a lot of these places don't have roads in and out of them. It's all by plane or by boat to get in and out of the towns. And so every four or five days at the longest, we would come across a small town and almost every single day we would see at least one motorboat go by uh -huh. or one fish camp set up on the river where locals would spend their summers fishing. Uh -huh. and, and I was not expecting that. Uh -huh. um, I'm hoping there's still some place I haven't found uh, <laughs> that is even more remote where I can truly experience that wilderness. Uh -huh. uh, but I, I was surprised. Yeah, but I mean, waterways are always used as means of transportation uh -huh. and, and the great connectors of small things. It's funny, in the Pacific here, we often think of the Pacific Islands out in Micronesia as tiny little islands separated by vast distances of ocean. Mm -hmm. The people there think of them as tiny little islands connected by an ocean. And they really have a very different mindset about the whole thing because they understand the ocean was what they used to get back and forth and see other people. And, you know, so, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's intriguing. I've never looked at it that way. That's <laughs> a, a good perspective. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, yeah they, uh, they, they do. So, um, Besides learning these things, you, you doubtless had some highs and some lows on this trip. Uh, yeah. Yeah, can, can, you, can you discuss some of those, some of the best and some of the worst? Yeah, let's start with the highs. Let's sure. start off good. Sure. Uh, there were some moments that you know, we really got to experience nature in a way that I never had before. Mm -hmm. uh, you hear the first wolf pack howling, or we even saw a wolf pack on the shore at one point when we were paddling by. They got startled by us and ran off. And seeing a wolf pack up close. Wow was so incredible. Uh -huh. I had never seen a wolf outside of a zoo before, and right. while there's some educational level to getting to see those animals in a zoo, seeing them in their natural environment, how massive they are, the footprints they leave behind, the kills that they're making, uh, was genuinely a good learning experience. Yeah. I won't say it, it, it's a joy, you're a little scared of the wolves, and right. you're a little sad for the animals they're killing. Right. So but, all, all inspiring, right? All inspiring, that's <laughs> right. a good way of putting right. it, yeah. Um, uh, on the low end of things, it would probably be the injuries I mentioned earlier. Um, at one point, I got some spasms in my lower back. And thankfully, we had just pulled off the river because there was high wind. And so we were stopped for the day anyways. But it got to the point where I could not walk. And I was trying to use a canoe paddle as a crutch uh -huh. to get myself the 20 meters to the tent, uh -huh. where I was trying to just curl into my sleeping bag for the next 18 hours and I couldn't make it those 20 meters. Oh, I wound up falling over because my lower back was just so stiff. Um, so the lows would probably definitely tie into that. And then uh, there's those moments that were both low and high. When we saw the beluga that you saw in the video earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's fascinating to get to see this animal up close, but it's tragic. We don't know how it got beached, how it died. Uh, what its story was, how old it was, we don't know any of that. Mm -hmm. So you see the, the sadness of nature and the joy of getting to learn from it being there. Yeah, yeah, okay, mm -hmm. great. And then there were the, the odd human interactions you had. You were, you had, you were telling me earlier the, the story of being in, in Dawson and the peculiar uh, uh, oh, yeah. beverage concoction they have there. Which <laughs> yeah, uh, so Dawson City, uh, Yukon Territory, Canada. It, familiar to most people because of the, the Yukon Gold Rush at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and <clears throat> there's only about 1,200 people who live there now. But the town has still a huge tourist uh, attraction, still lots of people coming through every season. And so one of the bars decided to capitalize on this and come up with a unique concoction uh, that <clears throat> you have to go to the bar, buy something that's at least 80 proof, and then you stand in line uh, for the human toe shot. 
they got this human toe. I we don't know, know if it was where. From, uh, from where. I don't know. And you go up, they keep it salted, and that's why you need 80 proof liquor, so it's sterile or whatever. But it's gross, shriveled, black, and they throw it in your drink, and you pay $5 for the honor of taking a shot. And it's, I think, a $3,000 fine if you swallow the toe. Uh, yeah, or they take one from you. <laughs> and so a lot of the people on the team did that shot. And a lot of the folks that we met and were hanging out with in Dawson City did it. Uh, I <clears throat> declined. A smart man. A smart <laughs> to take man. this shot. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, it was it was gross. Yeah, yeah, huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, amazing, amazing. <laughs> a d different side of a right. cultural experience. Yeah, exactly. Something you can't even associate with Canada. You have right. to associate with the very small town, uh, remote areas yeah. where you can do something this unique. Right, right. And it is that attraction for all these tourists. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, we, we talk uh, in the work I do about place-based learning, and that sounds mm -hmm. like a peculiar little example of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but just something that's going to be right there. Yeah. Um, so do you think that your videos will have different impacts on people who sort of are familiar with nature, who spend time out in the wild versus mm -hmm. people who don't? Do you think, do you think there's a, a difference in how they're going to react? I certainly think there will be some level of difference in how you react. As I mentioned, my primary goal is to inspire people to get out there mm -hmm. and experience it, no matter how small or large that experience may be. Mm -hmm. And so if someone who is already doing these sorts of things sees that video, sees the documentary, they'll probably really like hearing the story. Mm -hmm. They'll really enjoy seeing the shots from the Yukon if they've never visited and to get a better understanding of, of what that river is like. Mm -hmm. But they'll be less focused on the people which is what the story is really about, mm -hmm. because they're already in those people's shoes mm -hmm. in whatever adventures they have. Mm -hmm. Someone who hasn't done those things is probably going to have more of an attention on the people and hopefully feel compelled to get out there and hug a tree or <laughs> yeah. whatever it is they choose to do. Yeah, yeah excellent. No, that, that's, that's what you want to do is inspire people to action, right? And, yeah. and, and make them a little more aware of the, the, the beauties of nature is all around them. The, the fact yeah. that it is it's a disappearing resource, as you commented, mm -hmm. right? We are we are trashing large sections of, of this planet. Yeah. Uh, some parts of it pretty irrevocably. Uh, certainly for centuries, if not eons, uh, will never mm -hmm. never be the same. Um, less and less truly unspoiled uh, uh, places. Yeah. People even think uh, the Big Island here has a relatively small population. They think of it as relatively unspoiled, but many, much of the plant life on it was brought by the early Polynesians. There's actually a whole mm -hmm. issue here about what, what are native plants, because do you mean native before any human contact, or do you mean native before European contact? And those are two very different yeah. uh, flora assemblages, basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so yeah, there, there, there is that, that, whole, that whole thing. Um, so, in sort of learning to do this and, and uh, preparing uh, yourself, what advice would you give to any students who are sort of thinking, wow, this looks like this would be fun, you know, I'd, I'd love to get out there and, and videotape nature and you know, go mm -hmm. on these kind of journeys and all. How, what kinds of backgrounds do they need? What kinds of skills, mental attitudes do they, do they need? The biggest thing you need is a, a love for doing that sort of thing, for getting out into nature. Mm -hmm. Because I had that when I got to college. Mm -hmm. What I didn't have was a sense of direction as to where I would go. Mm -hmm. uh, I went through 11 different majors my freshman year. Wow. Ele 11. <laughs> I would be like, oh, doing Spanish sounds great. Oh, doing archaeology <laughs> sounds great. Oh, I would love to learn more about sociology <laughs> or English or history. <laughs> and I would sign up for these majors and think, this is it. And then two weeks later, I'd be like, oh, but what about this other thing? <laughs> And it wasn't until someone suggested that for my senior thesis, we do something called the, I went to St. Mary's College of Maryland, we do something called the St. Mary's Project during your whole senior year. And someone suggested at the end of my freshman year, you should through hike the Appalachian Trail and make a documentary about it. My first thought was, well, that idea is stupid, you can't do that for school. And 24 hours later, I'm busy researching everything I can find about the Appalachian Trail, wanting to do that. And as mentioned earlier, I did not succeed in completing the trail, but I did make a documentary for my senior thesis. What I didn't have, though, was a major. And so my college had a student design option that I was able to do. And I looked at what I wanted to do for my St. Mary's project and designed the entire curriculum around that idea. 
of going out and looking at how these people on the Appalachian Trail interact with their natural uh, and built environments with the mm -hmm. towns that are along there and the fact that a trail itself is not natural. Right. Uh, and it, it was really a joy to get to design that major mm -hmm. and to get to better understand what it would take to do this. Yeah. So anyone who's interested in getting involved in it, once you have that passion, you just have to take that passion and find a way to shape your learning, shape your educational experience into that field. Oh, okay, that's great. That's, that's very different from what I often hear when I ask, I ask this question pretty commonly. My guests here most of them say, oh, well, you know, start taking a lot of math courses, a lot of good science courses, prepare yourself in engineering, mm -hmm. da 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 and It's no good to take yeah. those courses if you don't have the drive. Right, right, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. In interesting to, to think about it in those terms. That's, mm -hmm. And indeed, I mean, that's, that is ultimately what will make uh, you a success in life, right, is, is to have real passion that'll, that'll keep you, that'll keep yeah. you showing up for work, whatever it is you do in the way yeah. of work, uh, mm -hmm. and, and not finding it drudgery, right? If, if, exactly. If this is, yeah. The beauty of my field is it's really easy to reignite that passion. Right. You just go out to a park. Right. You're feeling overwhelmed, you're right. feeling stressed out, go out to whatever local park, whatever river, and mm -hmm. an hour later you're feeling yeah. much better. Yeah. Yeah. And you're ready to tackle it again. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Yeah, I'm sure there must have been moments on, on your journey when you didn't feel like you really wanted to get up and get going on it, but uh, Definitely. You, you, well, of course, once you're on that kind of journey, you sort of have no choice but to continue it. <laughs> going forward or right. not going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, that, that's super. Um, you know, it, it's it's really it's amazing <laughs> hearing, hearing your story about eleven majors. I just got to ask you: did, did you keep your parents surprised of these changes? <laughs> occasionally, <laughs> only occasionally. Yeah, mostly, it was that that too fast them. of a turnover right. for them to be worried about. Well, I didn't it. talk uh, to you this week. I've, uh -huh. I've had two majors since I last <laughs> talked to you. <laughs> but no, that, that that's great that you were creative enough to 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 design your own design your own educational program. Very very uh, admirable that you did that. Um, I, I can't can't say how much I, I've enjoyed this. That I enjoyed seeing your video there. I enjoyed. Mm -hmm talking with you, watching these uh, background shots that have been popping up here. Well, it's uh, been great being and, on here and, and getting and, uh, the chance to talk to you with it. So well, I, I thank you very much. I, I look forward to talking to you in the future when it, I get, uh, maybe when you get the video uh, really cranked up, we can talk again, shoot twelve little segments of it on here and uh, see what yeah. we can do. That'd be wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jenny. Much. Thank you, Ethan. And join us next week on another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii.